times you don't see the forest for the trees. You have seen, in other words, you're looking too minutely that you don't see the big picture. Okay, so we're moving on this week into 2 Peter. We finished 1 Peter. We're moving on into 2 Peter, and we're going to do a forest look. We're going to do just kind of an introduction, look at the book as a whole. Uh, and then starting next week, we will jump into uh, expositorily preaching through various uh, verses. There, they brought up. Patty stuff she had downstairs. Okay, so let's jump, just jump into our message. Introduction to 2 Peter. All right, I do not have a joke this week. Oh, Pastor Eric. But I do have some interesting pictures. We just got through Christmas. Did you have a hard time finding gifts for people? I have some interesting gifts here that, uh, they, what did I call it? I call it this year's must have. So you can rush out and maybe they're on sale because Christmas is over. Here's the first one. If you got a little dog, they are selling these things that have a shoulder strap and you can carry your little dog with you. Isn't that, isn't that a nifty gift? That, <laughs> that way you can take your, your dog with you. A must have gift you got to have. Now, this next one. It's uh, alcohol-free beverage, but uh, here, if you're too lazy to hang on to your glass, here is an easy way for you to have your glass with you all the time. And now that's not alcohol in there, that's pop in there, or, or grape juice in there. Uh, I thought that was a nifty gift. This is a neat assortment. Somebody had this as an assortment of interesting gifts. And I thought they were interesting. This is interesting. Uh, it's a bed. Uh, it, you can see the mat it folds. A lot of they have that nowadays that your mattresses can fold up and sit up. But they have a television built right into the footer of the bed. If you a lot of people watch TV when they go to bed for a little while, you can just raise it up out of the footer of your bed and watch TV for a while. And then when it's done, you lower it back down into the bed and you and you go to sleep. Isn't that a nifty nifty gift to have? All right. This little baby, you know how they get so when you let, they love being snuggled. See, here, here's one for you. You can buy these hands that can snuggle the baby when you lay it down. And the baby, yeah, the baby still thinks it's being snuggled, huh? Isn't that neat? I thought that was neat. There's one around its head and the sink. Oh, my mom is here with me. <laughs> All right, here's one for you ladies who try to cut cloth. It has a laser built right into the shears. Now, I have a saw that's actually got a laser. So this is the same principle. Shines down the cloth so you got a line and you didn't have to draw the line on the cloth. You just, you just the problem is if you tilt your shears, won't the... Well, <laughs> Won't that line be way off? By the, by the time you get to the end, your line is six inches off. I, <laughs> oh, but they thought that was a nifty gift. It has the laser pointer right on the shears. You put a mark on the other end, you can keep the laser on that. Right? Yeah, to know where you're supposed to be cutting to, aiming at something, yeah. Isn't that a neat uh, um, shower curtain? You can buy that and put that up in your shower. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that would be a nifty one to to put into the into the shower. What movie? What old movie was it? Yeah, Psycho. That's right. Yeah. Well, there, there. You walk in there and you go, "Oh, I ain't taking no shower for a month because I can't get in there." All right. For grandparents, if you got multiple grandchildren, isn't this a nifty one? You don't have to hold six kids on your lap at the same time, or three anyway. You see the grandpa there, he's got two kids sitting on the little seats on the sides there. I thought that was, that was kind of a neat gift. You got little grandchildren, uh, you could get that and have it down at John's down there and, and, and use that when you go down. <laughs> I think there's one more here. No, there's two more. I like this next one. 
Put that rug around your toilet seat and the toilet cover, cover thing. Isn't that a nifty one? <laughs> I thought that was kind of nice. And then the next guy, the last one, he's kind of thirsty. He'll drink anything you pour down him. So you get that sticker and you can put it right in your sink. And there the guy is, is drinking all the time. Every time you run the tap, he's, he'll swallow it up. Well, I thought that was a set of nifty gifts. So now you can go to, I say rush out. You can pull your phone up right while I'm preaching and go to Amazon and order these things. Oh, all right. All right, so let's get into our, our text for the day. I put a text down there. We're just going to look at these first two verses. I'm going to cover them expositorily next week. I'm going to go through verses 1 through, uh, I think it's 11 next week. Um, but I just put these up to get us into the book of Second Peter. We just went through a series, a number of month series in First Peter. Last week we finished up the closing remarks of First Peter. Now we are starting 2 Peter, and this week we're going to look at an overview of 2 Peter. So it starts off this way. Peter says, and the, the new, uh, the, the ESV has Simeon Peter, other ones have Simon Peter. You remember he was called Simon, and then Jesus named him, gave him the name of Peter the Rock, and often he was called Simon Peter. So this is referring to him, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to get into that next week as we uh, expound these verses. But notice one of the problems, and we'll get into that this week, the problem for which Second Peter was written was false teachers had crept into his churches, the churches that he was writing to. So you notice here, Peter stresses that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. Apostles had authority in those days. He had walked with Jesus. He had seen the resurrected Jesus Christ. He had been appointed as an apostle. And so he is telling them to abandon, to stand firm in their faith, to abandon the false teaching. But notice he says, who he's writing to have obtained equal standing as what he has. So we have the blessings, and we'll get into this next week. We have all the blessings we need to walk a faithful Christian life. We'll talk about that. But so let's get, let's uh, let's look at the book as a whole. Okay. Here's my outline. I hope you picked up one of these out there. I have a number of blanks for you to fill in. Just a bunch of questions. Six questions. Who wrote this book? Well, we'll talk about that. Who wrote this book? Point number two. Uh, who did he write it to? Who was he writing this second book to? Point number three. When did he write it? Point number four. Why did he write it? Point number five, I don't want to go too fast for you. Scribble these down. Number five, what is the content of it? I got a simple, nice, simple outline um, of the book. Really, uh, just a couple of major topics that he covers in the book of Second Peter. And then number six, uh, what is the big idea of, of the book? What's the, what's the big idea of of the book of Second Peter. And that's really what I want to really hit because we're looking at the forest rather than minutely looking at each of the trees. We will get to the trees starting next week, but let's look at the forest. What is the big idea of it? Okay, point number one. Oh, no, not point number one. The second letter of Peter. It's addressed to the same network of churches as Peter's first letter and is likely written from the same location in Rome. Peter's become aware of the fact that he's going to die soon, and the evidence that we have from early tradition was that Peter was executed by the Roman authorities during the reign of Emperor Nero. And so this letter acts as Peter's farewell speech. He begins by offering a final challenge, that Jesus' followers must be people who never stop growing. And then this is followed by two final warnings about a growing number of corrupt teachers who are leading Christians in these church communities astray. First, by their corrupt way of life, and second, by their distorted theology. 
Throughout the letter, Peter is countering accusations made by these teachers against himself and the other apostles. And Peter's goal is to restore confidence and order to these church communities. So Peter opens by reminding these churches that through Jesus, God has invited people to become a participant in his own divine nature. That is, to share in God's own eternal life and love, which is mind-blowing. And it requires a lifelong response. To receive this gift means a commitment to developing the same character traits that mark God's own divine nature. Peter lists here seven traits to strive for. And the final one encompasses and crowns all of the others, it's love. Which according to Jesus means devoting oneself to the well-being of others, no matter their response or the cost. To love, according to Peter, is to share in God's own life. Peter then states the letter's purpose. It's going to act as a memorial of his teaching that can be passed on to later generations because he's not going to be around to give it much longer in person. So before he dies, he wants to address these objections and accusations being made by the teachers who distort Jesus' teaching and that of the apostles. So Peter first addresses an accusation repeated by the skeptics, present and future. Namely, that he and the apostles just made up all of this stuff about Jesus being risen from the dead and king of the world. Jesus isn't really going to come back one day. So Peter offers his eyewitness testimony of the powerful moment of Jesus' transformation on the mountain. Remember the story in Mark chapter 9. Mount of Transfiguration. He saw Jesus exalted as king. And his resurrection means that he's alive as king and will return to rescue our world one day. And so the future return of Jesus to bring God's kingdom, this will fulfill what all the ancient scriptures have been pointing to all along. The words of the Old Testament prophets, they're not fabricated fantasies. Rather, through these human words of scripture and through the human Jesus, God himself has spoken to us. Peter then moves on to address the threats raised by corrupt leaders in the church, and he focuses on more objections that they raise. So first, these teachers deny the idea of a final reckoning, when God's going to hold all people accountable for their choices. And this denial is what conveniently allows the teachers to ignore Jesus' teaching about money and sex, because they're making tons of profit by teaching in the churches, not to mention the fact that they're sleeping around. But Peter reminds the readers that God can and will meet rebellion with his justice. He recalls three ancient examples when God did this. He first mentions the story about the sons of God in Genesis 6, as it was interpreted in a popular Jewish work of the time called First Enoch. Mm -hmm. First Enoch says the sons of God are rebellious angels who crossed the line and slept with women, earning God's judgment. Peter then brings up the story of the ancient flood, and then the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. In each case, there was a rebellion that led to divine judgment. But, Peter says, God was always faithful to deliver his people, and he uses the story of Lot to provide an example. Peter then connects these ancient stories to the teacher's corrupt way of life. They too are after money and sex, they despise God's authority, and they lead other people to think that God doesn't care about moral decisions. He says they teach a message of Christian freedom and use it as a license to do whatever they want. And this is why Peter's going to bring up Paul's letters later on in chapter 3. It appears that these teachers have distorted Paul's message of liberation in Christ. But that's not the kind of freedom Paul meant. And Peter makes clear that these teachers are not really free. In reality, they're slaves to their bodily impulses. And the fact that they're Christians makes it even more tragic, because knowing Jesus' teaching makes them doubly accountable. They have become pitiful examples of the ancient proverb about a dog returning to its vomit and a washed pig going back to the mud. Peter then addresses the reasoning behind the teacher's denial of the final reckoning. They say generations of God's people keep coming and passing away without seeing the fulfillment of their hopes. Where is this promised return of Jesus? Peter responds by showing how short-sighted this objection is. Look around, he says, at this remarkable universe that we inhabit. The fact that we exist at all means that at some moment in the past, God's word intervened in a dramatic way to bring something out of nothing and to bring order out of chaos, and he can do so again. And so the real question is, why is God taking so long? But Peter reminds us that our human conception of time is extremely limited. The long expanses of time through which God works 
don't fit neatly into the A day is as a thousand prayer. years to the Lord. The long amount of time are actually a sign of God's patience, because each generation is offered the chance to recognize its own selfishness, to humble itself, and repent before God's generous grace. And God's grace will bring the story to a close on the day of the Lord. Here Peter draws upon the prophetic poetry of Isaiah and Zephaniah, who describe the day of God's justice as a consuming fire. Peter says, the heavens will pass away and the stoicheia will melt by fire. This is a Greek word that could refer to the elements, in which case it means the dissolution of the material universe, or more likely, it refers to heavenly bodies, in other words, the stars. That's what this word means in Isaiah chapter 34, where Peter is quoting from. And in that case, this line is a metaphor about the sky being peeled back, so to speak, before the God who sees all. And so this is why Peter says the day of the Lord will result in the earth and all its works being exposed. The ultimate purpose of God's consuming justice is not to scrap the material universe. Rather, it's to expose evil and injustice and remove it, so that a new kind of heavens and earth can emerge, one that is permeated with righteousness, full of God's love, and people who know and love God and love their neighbor as themselves. Peter concludes by saying, this is the true Christian hope that Jesus and all the apostles have been announcing, including Paul, whose writings can be misunderstood if you rip them out of context, but all the apostles are on the same page. And so Peter ends his final address to the church. Now the tone of 2 Peter, it feels really intense, but his passion comes from a firm conviction that God loves this world and he's determined to rescue it through Jesus. And so this means that God's love must confront and deal with the sin and injustice that ruins his beloved world. And in God's own time, he will do so, opening up a new future for humanity and for the universe itself. And so 2 Peter has a wide, expansive vision of hope for the whole world, and it challenges us to examine our everyday lives. That's what the second letter of Peter is all about. So you copied this down and the way as he went through that. As you had. There's a good little summary of Second Peter, and uh, we're going to kind of cover a lot of the same material today as that, as that talked about. But I uh, was able to nab this off the internet, a nice little summary of Second Peter for us. So let's get into our, our outline. First of all, who wrote the book? Well, verse 1 of the chapter uh, I've said this before, but, you know, the biblical pattern for letter writing was a whole lot better than ours is. We start off with who it's to, then the content of the letter, and then finally we tell them at the end who it is from, you know. Uh, how many times do you read a letter and then you get down to the bottom and you, oh, oh, that's from so-and-so. Well, they start off with letting you know who the letter is from right away. Peter says, uh, translated here in the ESV, Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. So this was, uh, this again was from Peter. We just uh, finished First Peter. And in the Gospels, we have a whole bunch of Peter. Uh, Peter was one of the disciples that Jesus chose. He was a fisherman. Um, I have here a little chart about, about Peter's life. I know it's kind of small, trying to fit the whole thing on there, but we have some dates here. Peter becomes a disciple of Jesus somewhere around here. We don't know the... Jesus, the Bible tells us Jesus was 30 years old when he started his ministry. But the people who set up our Gregorian calendar of B.C. and A.D., we're not sure whether they got year, you know, there wasn't no year zero, but the 1 B.C. and 1 A.D., whether they got that exactly right. Many Bible scholars believe Jesus was actually born around 3 to 4 B.C. from what our calendar is set up with. Anyway, so these are close dates. Uh, Peter was called to be a disciple. Uh, Peter denies Jesus somewhere in here. Uh, there's the death and resurrection, as you know, right after that. Shortly after that is the day of Pentecost. Peter becomes a, a church leader right here in the early 
a, years, a few years goes by where the church is growing in Jerusalem, and then Peter has his uh, vision of uh, the sheep coming down from heaven, and Peter visits Cornelius, who was a Gentile, and the gospel goes to a Gentile for the very first time. Though Paul became the apostle of the Gentiles, Peter was the first one to bring the gospel to Cornelius, to the Gentiles. Uh, Peter's in prison. Uh, Peter leaves Jerusalem. Peter goes to Rome somewhere in here. Uh, Nero started to reign in 54. Nero ended his reign. He actually committed suicide in 68 AD. Peter writes first, Peter, uh, I've told you the story where there was a fire in Rome and Nero blames the Christians and starts persecution against the Christians. And Peter uh, writes second Peter. And then shortly after that, Peter is martyred uh, while he is in Rome. So there's kind of an overview of, of Peter's, Peter's life. Um, I was going to mention, Peter, uh, church fathers tell us this, uh, that Peter was martyred in Rome somewhere near the end of Nero's uh, reign. Uh, they were going to crucify Peter because he was a Christian. He was a follower of Jesus, and that's how Jesus was crucified. And church tradition, church fathers quote this, they say that Peter said, um, I am unworthy to be martyred as my Lord was. So they took him and they crucified him upside down. That's what church tradition has, as uh, Peter's martyred them. But Peter, we'll see, in the book of 2 Peter, Peter knows that he's at the end of his life. So this was shortly before he was martyred. We got the book of 2 Timothy. Paul mentions that his, his run his race, uh, the end is at hand. Paul knew he was going to be martyred uh, in 2 Timothy. While well, Peter knew that he was going to be martyred here uh, in the book of 2 Peter. Okay, so there's a short list, uh, just a little short overview of Peter's life after he left his fishing vessel and became a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, who did he write it to? Well, verse 2 says that Peter, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So who is he referring to there? He's referring to Christians. Okay, So it looks like it is a very general epistle to all believers, which it could, you, could, you could say that, but... Later on in the book, chapter 3, verse 1, Peter says, This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. What does that refer to? Well, that refers to 1 Peter. And in 1 Peter, we got the verse coming up, he had specific group, specific church that he wrote it to. Remember, it was the outskirt provinces of the Roman Empire that persecution was coming to. He says to them, now this is the second letter I'm writing to you people. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. That word, uh, I gotta get the right button, reminder. This book is a book of reminders. He uses that word remembrance and reminder. He uses that a whole bunch through this book. It's as if he is saying, you guys know all of this stuff, but I want to remind you of it again. Have you ever had it? I have to say that I am guilty. I don't always sit in the congregation, but there are times when I am preached to, uh, somebody else is preaching and I'm in the congregation, and they bring up the text or they bring up the topic that they're going to preach on, and what runs through my mind is, oh, I know this stuff. 
And then I have to rebuke myself because, well, does that mean I don't listen? I just sit back? Uh, Peter's telling these people they knew all this stuff, but he was reminding them again. Oh, yeah, that's right, Peter. I wish somebody had reminded me to order those cups for the communion. We need reminders. Laurel said, did you put that on your list? <laughs> We need reminders. So this is a book uh, of reminders to these people. So here's 1 Peter. 1 Peter, the book of 1 Peter that we've already gone through. Peter tells us who he wrote that book to. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those that, who are elect exiles in the dispersion of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, five outer provinces of the Roman Empire. And let me go back a slide then. So ver chapter 3, verse 1 says, I am writing you this second letter. Okay, so he's writing this letter to the same people that he wrote 1 Peter 2. Christians who were scattered throughout the Roman Empire who may be in 1 Peter, may be for you facing first, uh, they may be facing persecution in 2 Peter, those who are hearing and somewhat picking up false doctrine. He wants to remind them to stay away from that. Okay, when did he write the letter? Well, uh, we kind of talked a little bit about that. Peter makes reference to his imminent death. We'll look at that verse in just a minute. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 14, he knew he was going to die. Uh, Nero... It is generally accepted that Peter died in the reign of Nero. Nero started persecution against Christians. Now, there were other local persecutions, but Nero started a massive persecution throughout the whole Roman Empire. Christianity had spread. Paul had gone on his missionary journeys, and, and other Christians had spread the gospel. Christianity was growing. Nero found them a convenient group to blame, and Nero started persecution against the Christians throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, Nero died in 68 AD, so this epistle must have been written before then. Uh, this epistle, therefore, probably was written sometime during somewhere around 67 AD. We don't know the exact year, but if Nero was gone by 68 uh, this was written before Peter was martyred, obviously. Uh, so it was written somewhere in here. So let's, say, let's say 67 AD. So 30 some years after Jesus Christ was crucified and the church began on the day of Pentecost. He mentions his previous book to the readers, so this was written probably a few months, we don't know how long, but a few months perhaps after his first book was written. Okay? All right, so there are, you think of 1 Peter and 2 Peter, the content is drastically different. 1 Peter talks about the coming persecution and facing this persecution and, and trusting in God. 2 Peter, the main topic is false teachers We'll talk about that in here. Okay, here, here's First Peter or Second Peter chapter one. This is where Peter knows that he's going to be martyred. Look at what he says here. Verse 13, chapter one, I think it right as long as I am in this body, he's still in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder. There's that word, huh? Reminder. Since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as the Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. How did Peter have a vision from the Lord? And the Lord said to him, you are going to be martyred soon, Peter. It's what it sounds like this verse is getting at. Peter doesn't seem to be, I know there's persecution, and it seems like I probably will be martyred. Peter is saying the Lord had revealed to him somehow that he was going to be, to, to, to be martyred. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Interesting. Peter says here, he says he's in his body now. He's still here in this life. 
Uh, but there's going to come a time where he will put off his body. Isn't that an interesting uh, description of death? Our spirit leaves, departs our body, and goes to dwell in the presence of the Lord. Uh, he says, uh, after my departure, it's a departure, just like you're taking a plane out of Grand Rapids. You know, he is departing this earth to be with his Lord. I like that. All right. Point number four. I'm watching my time here. Why did he write it? Well, I put in here quotes. Let me remind you. Peter uses that word over and over and over again. All right. Second Peter chapter one, verse 12. He says, therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities. I have one of the sermons I have coming up is the ministry of reminding. <laughs> That's the ministry my wife has with me. My mind isn't as sharp as what it used to be. So she often has to remind me of things. Well, Peter had a ministry of reminding. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities so you know them and are established in the truth that you have. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. He's saying in the Old Testament there were false prophets, and he says, you know what, believers? There is going to be false teachers creeping in among you. I had mentioned uh, last week, a couple of weeks ago, there is an interesting relationship between 2 Peter chapter 2, where Peter addresses the false prophets, or the false teachers, Peter, and I'll bring this up again, but I'll remind you again later. Uh, get it? Remind you again later. Peter says there will be false teachers. Jude, chap, uh, verse 1, there's only one chapter, so I can't say chapter 1, verse 1. Jude, verse 1 says they are here. So Jude is addressing, Jude is very similar to 2 Peter chapter 2, except Peter is saying these false teachers will come. Maybe it was the beginning of some false teaching creeping into the churches. And Jude says, they are here, people. You need to combat false teaching. So his purpose in writing this, first of all, to remind, oh, here's a couple more verses. I just want to, you notice the red there. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, I always remind you, and then at the end of that, verse 13, uh, oh, verse, end of verse 12, reminder. And then in 2 Peter chapter 3, he says, sincere minds by way of reminder that you should remember, and this is only just a few of them. That word appears in 2 Peter a whole bunch of times, or similar words. Peter wants to remind these believers of truths they already know. When Paul came and preached and started that church, and uh, uh, that church had been growing, you know these things. Why are you falling for these false teachers when you already know the truth? That's what Peter is saying in this book. Okay, Chuck Swindoll. You all know Chuck Swindoll. Been a radio preacher for years. Became the president of Dallas Theological Seminary, a very conservative seminary down in Dallas, Texas. He started now one of the fastest growing churches down in the Dallas area. Anyway, he wrote this. Peter wrote this letter from Rome soon after he wrote 1 Peter. So what would have prompted another letter to the same group so soon after the first? From the context of the letter, it appears that Peter had received reports of false teachers in and among the churches of Asia Minor. False teachers were beginning to creep in. So Peter felt he needed to write a letter. The apostle warned them about the insidious presence of those who, spent, <coughs> who spread heresies among the people. Peter wanted to, re here's the word, remind his people to stand firm. 
All right, what is the content of the book? Well, let me give you a simple outline. Chapter one, he has a uh, introduction, okay? Verses one through 11. And in that introduction, he was reminding them, get it? Reminding them about the grace of God. Then the rest of chapter one, he reminds them of true doctrine. We will talk about that, obviously, when we get there. Then when he gets into chapter 2, almost the entirety of chapter 2 uh, is about false teachers that are coming in to the church. And then apparently the false teachers, as pa uh, Peter says in chapter 3, they were denying the second coming. So the topic of chapter 3 is all about that the second coming will happen. You know, a day to the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day, but the Lord will come, Peter said. So, if I can summarize the book even shorter, Peter reminds them of true doctrine. He tells them there are going to be false teachers. He warns them about that. And one of the big false teachings will be about the second coming and reminds them the truth of the second coming again. And then he concludes his letter. So those are kind of the main topics of the book. Remain strong. Stand firm. Don't fall to false doctrine. You know, it is very easy. I, did, I hate to start naming names, but you look, you listen to some of these, some of these television preachers, and somehow the the false doctrine of prosperity gospel. Jesus wants you well. Jesus wants you rich. All you got to do is send me fifty dollars, and God will give you five thousand dollars. You know that type of a thing uh, permeate television evangelists, and and there are false teachings that are permeating the church today. Article on Fox News yesterday, the United Methodist Church, I know they have drifted for years, but the United Methodist Church has agreed. The problem that the United Methodist Church had was there were very liberal ones that had drifted to deny the teachings of the Bible, and there were conservative uh, Methodist pastors who still hold to the teachings of the Bible, and so they have argued for a number of years. They have agreed to split, and the issue that is splitting them is um, the liberal end feels it's okay to ordain gay and lesbian pastors. They're going to do that, and the conservative group is not. Well, we have looked at verses where Paul lists homosexuality as being a sin. Sure, we all have sin, but that don't mean you ordain an openly homosexual for the work of the ministry, you know? Um, Anyway, false doctrine. False doctrine is in among the church today. All right, what's the big idea? Again, a quote from Chuck Swindoll. He says, Peter's theme in his second letter is simply one. Pursue spiritual maturity through the word of God as a remedy for false teaching and a right response to heretics in the light of Christ's promised second coming. That was one of the heresies that they were teaching, that Jesus isn't ever going to come back. Look how long it's been. And he hasn't, you know, and that was, that was 2,000 years ago they were saying that. Now how much more people can say, he's never coming back again, you know. So Peter wants to com combat that false teaching. When false teachers begin to whisper their sweet words into the ears of immature Christians, the body of Christ begins to lose what makes it distinctive in the first place. Faith in the unique person and work of Jesus Christ. Peter repeatedly points to the word of God as the primary means of growth for the Christian. Continuing on, Chuck Swindoll's, Charles Swindoll's words here. Peter encouraged his readers to apply themselves to acquiring the true knowledge of God and living out the life of faith with all diligence. Quote from 2 Peter. So that they may be found by Jesus in peace, 
spotless and blameless. Notice the reference there in chapter 3, talking about when Jesus does come, that he will find us spotless and blameless. All right. Oh, I had one more point here. And if believers did not follow his advice, they should be giving their Christian community over to the heretics, people who look to exploit with false words. You, in that video, it pointed out how they were living for the money and for very corruptly the false teachers were and somewhat a sign of what false teachers are, that they have a love of money and a love of worldliness and a sensual lifestyle. All right, here's my conclusion. All right, so there's an overview of the book. Okay? Correct Bible teaching is important. Are you getting into the Word? Are you listening to good biblical sound teaching? Are you studying it for yourself? Are you being like the, in the book of Acts, the Bereans who searched the Scriptures daily to see whether what they heard, what Pastor Herrick was preaching, what others you may hear, is truly biblical. You need to do that. The Bible is our standard. True doctrine shall, should lead to a holy and faith-filled life. We need to be careful to follow what the Bible says. Do I have a fourth point, or is it going to go right into my closing song? I don't know. It might go right into the closing song. So here we go. Oh, I had a fourth point. There we go. I did have one. And to live a life filled with holiness and good works towards others. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we work our way through this book of 1 Peter, or of 2 Peter, Father, that it will affect and change our lives May it give us a desire to know your truth better, that we would not fall to a false doctrine. Bless your word to our lives, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close with, I surrender all.